Jacobs. Welcome to the Rocky Mountain Rider podcast. Thanks, Mark. It's great to have you, and we are so looking forward to having you out in Denver for the Colorado Gold Conference in October as a keynote speaker. So um, excited about that. That makes two of us. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it. I assume you've been to Colorado and Denver before. Yes, sir. Yeah. And where are where do you live? Where are we catching you now? I'm in Baltimore now. My wife and I moved here about five years ago from D.C. And before that, we were in Atlanta for about 17 years. So very East Coast kind of orientation. Except for where I was born, which is La Crosse, Wisconsin, right along ah. Wisconsin's West Coast, where the Mississippi River is. Nice, nice. Yep. Very cool. Well, I'm just curious, how did the connection with Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers and getting an invite as keynote speaker, do you know how that came about? Uh, f- I have no idea. I yeah. pitched them. I said, this is who I am and what I do. And they said, yes. So I think that's how it all happened. Well, that's great. You sent a marvelous list of questions, and uh, I really, really appreciate that. And there's so much to get into about you and your background. And I want to get into your years of journalism and how that connects to writing fiction and all that good stuff. I also came out of journalism and and into writing fiction. Um, But let's start with the latest novel you've got, just to give our listeners an idea of what kinds of fiction you're interested in, and we want to introduce them to your whole series. So tell us about Fake. Fake is my most recent novel. It's number five in the Lark Chadwick mystery suspense thriller series. I write as a 20-something young woman. There's probably a 12-step program for that. (laughs) But, uh, and that's, that's, I just stumbled into that. But um, most of, all of my novels have journalism as a backdrop. Uh, And so by the time Fake comes along, Lark is a White House correspondent. And I started writing the novel right after Donald Trump was elected president. And I was troubled because he kept calling journalists the enemy of the American people. And I did not set out to write an anti-Trump polemic because truth is real. You know, no one political party has, you know, a handle or or corners the market on truth. I mean, there people lie to reporters all the time from both parties. So, uh, uh, but I, but I did want to talk about and write about the consequences of made-up information. I mean, a lot of people don't understand. They, they really think we sit around and try to plan who's going to be the next president when uh-huh. making it up is a firing offense. And so, what I tried to do in fake was just to show the the danger of misinformation. So in the next uh, few years of writing that novel, I assume gave you plenty of material. Yes, I, I actually had to go back to the drawing board because uh, just about the time I would uh, set out on a plot, it was like that happened. So I'd have to go, well, I can't do that anymore. So uh, uh, it, it did take a lot of procrastination uh, before I was able to, to nail it down. Yeah. Well, tell us about her, the main character in her arc. You say in the latest novel, she's a White House correspondent. So by uh, deduction, I'm assuming she didn't start there. So. She didn't start there. She, the, her backstory uh, was that she was an English major at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And she was a senior just getting ready to graduate when she was sexually assaulted by her English professor. And so the story of Fast Track, which is the first novel in the series, picks up when she is a waitress or a server at a restaurant. She's written the great American novel that keeps getting rejected. And the book begins when she discovers the body of the aunt who raised her from infancy after Lark's parents were killed in a car accident. And so the trauma of finding her aunt dead on the floor launches Lark on a search to find out more about her past. So she goes to the small town in Wisconsin where the accident happened, gets a newspaper clipping, and to her astonishment, she discovers that she's the miracle baby who survived a car train collision. No one had ever told her about that. So the newspaper editor, a former New York Times uh, uh, editor, uh, she convinces him to let her do a follow-up story. Two of her sources are the mayor and the sheriff. 
They're running against each other for Congress. The election is one week away, and each guy has a secret that will unravel the mystery. Da, da, da. So that, <laughs> that's basically how she gets into journalism. That's great. When did you start writing the series? Were you still a working journalist? When you began? I was working at CNN. I, I uh, started, I was the White House correspondent before I joined CNN as a writer in Atlanta in 1988. And probably the reason I started writing fiction is that one of the editors I worked with on the overnight shift said, you ever thought about being a copy editor? I said, no. He said, you'd be a great copy editor. What he meant was, I want off nights and weekends, and you'd be a great warm body to replace me. <laughs> so sure enough, he got the great shift. I got his job overnights, weekends for the next seven or eight years. And I discovered that editing is tedious. It pays well, but it's tedious. It's not creative in the same way the other side of the house is. And so this was probably 1994 that I started writing the first draft of Fast Track, but it took 10 years to get the agent I've got. The novel went through 14 major revisions and my agent is the 39th agent that I queried. So I tell my writing students, if you take good notes, I'll save you nine years in the process because <laughs> I learned a lot from that experience. That's great, wow. Uh, and I, is that your, still your agent today? Yes, same agent yeah. 15 years, years later, wow. Barbara Casey. Wow, and care to mention the name of the agency because she deserves some credit. Bar Barbara Casey and the Barbara Casey Agency. Fantastic. I'm not. I'm not sure she's accepting any new clients anymore. That's okay. We would just. So want to I, I may be looking for a new agent myself. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, uh, we'll leave a lot of the. Unfortunately, we want to. Um, we can't get into every novel and every um, story that you put out there in the series. Five books to date. Correct. That's right. Yeah. And um, what would you say just overall writing this series? Did you? know where it was going did you know it was going to be a series from the first book and um are you are you planning her arc and her her future challenges ahead of time or are you just following this organically to see where she's going to go it it started and continues organically i i didn't set out to start a, a series i started out to get published and ended up realizing oh there's another story there uh, it was hard enough just to get you know, that first book published, but in the process, you realize that there, there's really a lot more to it than that. And um, so I still have other ideas in mind. I'm working on a memoir now, but, uh, you know, bo book six is uh, percolating. Gotcha. Well, there's lots and lots of books out there, mysteries, suspense with reporters as a main character. Uh, did you set out to sort of write some of the sort of cliche wrongs that you often see? Did you want to bring a level of accuracy to the description of the business and how it functions, especially with those relationships with the sources, things like that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I did, I wasn't really setting out to, you know, to give a message or uh, a how-to about journalism, but, you know, they always say, write what you know, and that's, that's what I know, and I've known it for 45 years. So, you know, there are good journalists and bad journalists, ethical journalists, and uh, people who cut corners. And, and so, you know, I wanted to, you know, get that out there. I mean, I'm not an apologist for journalism, because I think journalism has some serious problems, especially broadcast journalism. But, uh, you know, it's an admirable profession. It's important. It's enshrined in the, in the Constitution. So uh, uh, I just find that that's a good backdrop for telling stories. And, uh, you know, Lark has a, a lot of potential. Someone suggested that when I started writing, you know, if you're going to have a series character, you know, don't make her 75. So, so I made her in her 20s. You know? Yeah, that's great. Talk to us a little bit about your experience. You work, you're been working with one of the biggest names in broadcast news, Mr. Wolf Blitzer. That must have been, and he gets parodied a little bit here and there, but what a legend. What was it like working with him? Oh, Wolf is fabulous to work with, and he's got a great sense of humor. Uh, you would probably never know it because he's very, he is very straight ahead. 
but uh, because you know, I think I think more than anything, he cares about accuracy, and uh, and so he's very serious minded on camera, off camera. He's he quotes his dad a lot. His dad came up with a lot of Yogi Berra isms. So you know, Wolf will say, you know, as my as my father David David Blitzer would say, you know, rich or poor, it's good to have money. You know, <laughs> you know stuff like that. So uh, you know, he's just. He's a, he's just, he, he really cares about the people he works with, not to mention just being accurate. So being around him was, was indeed being with a legend. Is there a Wolf Blitzer like character who pops up in any of your books or runs throughout them? No, but maybe there should be. <laughs> what, what did you find was the biggest switch for you from writing news copy to writing fiction? Well, the hardest thing is that it's a firing offense to make it up. And so it was, it was really hard to give myself license to not just stick with whatever I saw in my head or whatever real life experience I was drawing from, but to actually, you know, have that courage and freedom to make it up. I think that was the hardest part. Yeah. Uh, And And you said earlier, it was interesting, you talked about how the fact that maybe somebody would turn up in the paper, there was sort of a story or a theme or an idea for a plot thing that was something you had already started to work on. You had to pull that back. You you didn't feel like you could, it might be too close to reality. Is that that what I heard you say? Well, I mean, that's certainly certainly something that you have to be careful about. Um, Yeah. There are usually by the time you've got five novels going, you've got, you know, you've got characters and they have their lives. And so, you know, you can take whatever the facts are that inspired your story and change them to fit whatever the storyline is and the character arc is for the different different people. But, uh, you know, there are some things that you can draw upon that are that are factual and that are historically accurate. But then there are others that you can just draw upon and be inspired by. And then, you know, you get you get to make up the news. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a real rush to be able to do that. Yeah. So talk to us about writing as a woman uh, that, uh, you know, a lot of people say that's something you probably shouldn't do. Um, but I always argue that you've got male and female there's at least unless you're talking about a the you know novel with matt damon on on mars that wasn't the novel that was the movie based on the novel but most novels have men and women and chances are you're going to write about a woman whether you're embodying that person or not but you're not supposed to they say do what you're doing well, yeah, and and if I probably heard them say that before I started doing it, maybe I would have been intimidated and stopped. But, you know, um, when I first started writing, someone suggested that you should write in a way that stretches who you are. I'd never been a woman, at least not in this life. So I started, <laughs> do- so I started doing it, and I discovered that it wasn't as difficult as I expected it would be because emotions aren't gender specific. We all have the exact same emotion, emotions. It's just that in my experience, it's the women who are more articulate about their emotions. They have a, a better, um, a more varied emotional palette to draw from. Uh, they're more willing to share their emotions. And so, uh, and plus there are plenty of women in my life whose words I could draw from in their psyches and so on. I mean, when I worked at, I worked at CNN 25 years. So that's 25 years worth of young women in their early to mid twenties, mostly interns and early and and new hires who would tell me their stories about their boyfriends and their careers and their families. And I just listen and, and take all that stuff in. And then of course, you have women as beta readers who will tell you what you're getting right, what you're getting wrong. And so uh, I just kept at it because apparent, I mean, Carol Costello uh, was one of the anchors I worked with and she read an early draft and she said, you know, you have a well-developed female side. And I think she meant it that as, as a compliment. <laughs> 
And so, you know, that, that kind of encouragement helped me to, you know, go forward with it. Again, my agent is a woman, so, you know, you can't please everybody. And I know that, but I think it can be done because as you say, you know, even if you're not going to have a protagonist, if you're a guy writing as a, as a, doing fiction, you know, you're going to have women and men in your, in your story, no matter what. Although one of my students once said, uh, he's a guy, he said, I do not understand women, therefore I don't write them. <laughs> so he's only got guys in his books. Okay, yeah. fine. Yeah. Well, good luck in life with that attitude. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, coincidentally, I have five books out. Coincidentally, my protagonist is a woman, and uh, she happens to be an outdoor hunting guide. Obviously, outdoors, if she's a hunting guide, that went without saying. <laughs> but uh, I've always maintained that um, you don't need to understand all women to write about a woman. You need to understand your character to know how she views the world, just as you would pick out a man, you can have everybody from Pollyanna, who was a female character, to the serial killer that Charlize Theron played in the movie Monster. She was right. a woman. These are all women. There's a spectrum. Find your place for that character on the spectrum. And how do they view life? How do they take in life? How do they sleep with men? How do they treat their family? How do they do this? You can, you know, I think you can be as specific as you can. If you create a specific person, right. That's, that's maybe the bigger priority than the gender, at least maybe. I think you're right. And, and what I've done is I've basically, yeah, I mean, I think most writers draw from a lot of personal experience and maybe even their own personal emotions and psyche and so on. And I know I did because I've experienced all the emotions Lark does. And, uh, and so I just put a skirt on, I guess you could say to uh, not literally, there was a woman at a book signing who raised her hand and said, what do you wear when you write? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I don't wear a skirt when I write, but, uh, but sort of metaphorically I do um, because I think there's an empathy factor here. Um, I mean, you know, the more women I've talked to, the more I understand something that I never understood as a guy. And that is women have to make a decision in the first 10 to 15 seconds. If this is even a safe situation, you know, I've never had to worry about that in the same way. So just listening to women, you know, just listening to women tell me what it's like to be in those situations helped inform my character and help me understand and empathize with women a lot more too, I think. Well, again, I appreciate your list of questions, and I have to ask this one. <laughs> what, Which one's that? What have you learned about the mistakes men make in forging meaningful relationships with women? And I'd like to note that this is a writing show, not a dating show uh, podcast. <laughs> but <laughs> what have you learned about the mistakes men make in forging meaningful relationships with women? John Dukakis. <laughs> well, one of the things I've learned in this, most guys have been taught by their moms to be nice. And yet most guys get discouraged when the woman falls for the bad boy. And, and it's like, what? And it's a confidence thing. You know, bad boys can be mean and that's why they get a bad reputation. But there was a woman I worked with at CNN gorgeous, going through a divorce. And she said once, wistfully, she said, I always seem to fall for the bad boys. And I said, why is that? And it's like, she'd never been asked the question before. And she said, totally seriously, she said, they're the only ones who have the confidence to approach me. And she really nailed it there. Because I think the biggest mistake guys make is they're needy, um, they're trying to impress her with how much money they make or their, or their title or whatever. And instead, or they put them on a pedestal. You're beautiful. A beautiful woman hears that all the time. It's boring. What they really want is to play banter. And, you know, nice guys are afraid to do that because they don't want to offend. You know, they don't want to strike out, but they strike out anyway. They lose cool points over and over and over again because they're not confident. That's very good. I like that a lot. Um, very helpful. So 
just looking ahead to October is without giving, I don't want to give away your keynote speech or, you know, what some of your classes might be, but sort of what are the bigger themes that you want to impart to um, up and coming writers, middle career writers, what kind of messages and ideas do you want to leave folks with that, that, you know, drawn from what your experiences have been in the business? Well, what if I'm going to be uh, teaching a master class on, I think it's going to be dealing with, uh, you know, deep listening skills for writers. Um, I, f- I forget all the things I'm going to be teaching, yeah. but, uh, and, and the keynote is going to address the issue of fear because that is a constant companion for writers. And I mean, I think that's at the root of writer's block. We're afraid of making mistakes. We're afraid that we're going to be rejected. We're afraid that we're going to be judged or being or not good enough or not perfect. And the irony is all of those things are going to happen. Uh, And so what I want to talk about is, in a sense, how to harness the fear so that it doesn't become a crippler. Yeah. And what was your own? uh, How did you grapple with your own fears? How did you break through or did you have any? Oh, sure. I mean, I think, I think to be human is to have fear. And the, what's counterintuitive is that you go forward in spite of your fear. You do things that frighten you. And you find that when you do that, the world doesn't blow up. You know, nobody is shooting at you. And, you know, maybe some of the things that you feared happen. You'll get rejected or something. But when you do something that you're afraid of and it doesn't turn out so bad, you have the confidence to do it again. So going forward with your fear creates confidence and courage. Did you find more fear just in those initial stages of putting words on the page for your first novel? Or did you find more fear in terms of dealing with the 10th or 12th rejection before you went to number 39, finding an agent? Actually, I mean, I think it took maybe nine months to write the first draft, three months to revise it, and a year and a half to get the courage to show it to anybody. Wow. So the thing I was afraid of is somebody would say, this sucks. And of course, it did suck. But uh, I finally realized that, you know, until I really get some feedback, I'm not going to know where the strengths and weaknesses are. And then after you did show it to somebody, that's been a year and a half since you showed it to anybody, and then, then you accumulated some feedback and then did another draft? Yes, did 14 altogether. 14 and drafts. 14 drafts, and probably around the 10th, uh, I was still getting rejected, and I went to, by this time, and a publisher had rejected it and said, it's not, a, it's not literary, it's not a romance, it's not a mystery, I don't know what it is, Therefore, I don't know how to market it. And so I went to this book club that met in our neighborhood in Atlanta. 25 women read the manuscript and then let me sit in on their critique, which was daunting to begin with. But I learned in listening to them talk about it that I had three subplots that I didn't need. And when I extracted those, the novel went from a 150,000 word mishmash to a 75,000 word mystery suspense novel. I didn't even know what my genre was until I was able to process those criticisms. So you're not afraid to kill your darlings. Oh, they're dead, man. (laughs) Did you take them all out back and dig a hole or what? Uh, You know what? That's the cool thing about, about editing um, you can still recycle them in, you know, in a uh-huh. future novel. I mean, if you save your drafts in a pristine, you know, draft file, then uh, you can you can resurrect some of that later on. It never, you know, it never they never really die. You can yeah. still use them. Yeah, you just don't so, have to shoehorn everything into one book. Right. So you are a manuscript editor now, also. That's right. And- I, I'm a I'm a writing coach. So I work with people one-on-one, I'm a manuscript editor, and then I teach writing classes as well at different writing centers and writers' conferences. And how many clients do you take on at a time, manuscript editing-wise? Well, you know, you do one at a time. Okay. And uh, there have been a couple of where I've had two going at once or so, but it, it, you know, I, I retired from CNN in 2013. And so, you know, I don't really need to do this, but I like to do it. 
And so I've got several clients that I'm coaching and it's sort of on an as needed basis. So, you know, when they need me, they'll call me and we'll have a chat and, uh, and all of that. And then I usually have at least one manuscript that I'm working on at a time. And are these what I would call developmental edits? Depends on where it really depends on the situation. I, okay. I, I encourage people to get a beta reader and to get their free feedback first. So often, often people send me their first draft just because they really want to see how it is. And I do a manuscript assessment on that as opposed to a deep dive copy edit. Um, but it just, it depends. I've, yeah. I'm, I've worked with some people several times on several different manuscripts and several different books. Huh. Wow. Yeah. What, what, well, first of all, you must learn a lot of, see a lot of mistakes. So yes, give, give us, give us an idea of some of the common mistakes you see and are, are they, are they mistakes that you can avoid without just simply writing more copy and learning yourself? Are these things you can give a list, don't do these 10 things or? Well, one of the things people do, especially rookie writers, is they throw backstory into the first few chapters. And, uh, you know, no, I mean, it's good for you to know what your backstory is, but sprinkle those kinds of things into the story. Start the story and then let the reader figure things out as it goes on, as opposed to overwhelming them with stuff that they don't know if it's important or not yet, because they're not in best characters, because they haven't seen the characters, gotten to know them in real life situations. So that's probably a big beef. A, a little one, this is a nitpicky kind of thing that I don't think a lot of people realize. Keep your paragraphs short, uh, because that adds white space to the page. What's literary about that? Nothing. It's psychological. You know, it's daunting to have these big, blocky paragraphs of black ink. You go, oh, I'm turning out the light, man. And, you know, when, this, when the focus shifts, start a new paragraph. It's, it's unlike what your English teacher probably told you, it's okay to have a paragraph that's one word. Absolutely. Your, your reader will thank you. Got to be reader friendly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Make them feel like they're making progress in your book too. You know, cut down your exactly. chapter lengths. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. Readers yep. like to feel like, oh yeah, I'm on chapter 20 and you know, good. Yeah. Not just 20 it's all, chapters. It's all psychology. It's all yeah. psychology. Obviously the words have to be good and the story has to be good as well. Oh, um, that. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So I can see you're going to bring a fair amount of humor to your approach here. This is, you, you seem to get a lot of joy out of writing fiction and thinking about writing fiction. I do. And what really uh, gives me joy is to be able to encourage other people. It is so much fun, especially with people who are, who really have been thinking about a novel for decades, but they feel overwhelmed by the process. What I love to be able to do is to deconstruct it and help them to see that it really is doable if you're a communicator. And if you can, and that's what really uh, excites me is to be able to see that light bulb go off. Are you a little bit surprised at your own, you know, production that you have five books out in the world and you're working on more? Are you a little, when you look back and think about that uh, 14th draft of that first novel and you, you must sort of feel accomplished about that. Well, I do. And, and on the other hand, I look at, you know, some of these other people who've got 60 books or 20 books or whatever. And I'm going, well, geez, you know, uh, if I didn't procrastinate so much, I could have so many more. So, you know, it's a blessing and a curse. You go, well, you know, there are five, but there could have been 20, you know, so I'm never satisfied. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What, uh, what's your take on independent publishing and you know, what's happening in the, in the world out there now with it just so much has changed in the last, when, when was your first book came out in first book came out in 2005. Okay. So yes, you, 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 the back then independent publishing wasn't a thing. Right. And print on demand was just beginning and right. self-publishing was not as, as ubiquitous as it is now. Yeah. Things are changing just like the music industry. It's all very nichified, which means it is, I think there are there are uh, thousands there are tens of thousands of books a day that are being published. I mean, the competition is just 
astonishing. And so you have to be a marketer as well. Um, even if you got a book deal today, at Random House, you would have to, it, gone are the days where they're going to pay for your cross-country book tour, unless you're John Grisham and you don't need it. Yeah. So they even, even they care about whether or not you know how to market yourself. Um, so the, the industry has changed tremendously and if probably for the better, just because it's more likely that you'll get published, whether it's self-published or not. Um, but the problem is a lot of self-published books have a reputation of not being as good as, you know, some of the, the things that go through, you know, the, the traditional agent publisher relationship, but, uh, you know, it's much more likely to get published, but you still need to bring your writing to a professional level. Yeah. There's you're in control if you self-publish. So why not? Why wouldn't you want to have it professionally edited and professionally designed and professionally produced as a uh, something that a reader can pick up and it could be indistinguishable from something from the big five in terms of look and feel and quality of the. Quality Absolutely. Of the and they have, they have hybrid self-publishing now so that there are some self-publishers who will sort of, you know, you pay them in sort of incrementally based on the need. If you need someone to help you market it, You'll pay for that, but it's probably worth it. If you need an editorial uh, eye, they've got that. If you need a book des a cover designer, they can do that. Or if you just want them to put it up on the on the web, they can do that too. Yeah. So is that some of your coaching? Ex that's sort of sort of some of your coaching um, experience as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't work with uh, self publishers, and I don't I don't know how to format stuff that way. You know, my expertise is more in terms of the, you know, the copy editing and just the, is, does the story work kind of thing. Uh, but I've, I've got a lot of friends who do self-publishing, you know, who are self-publishers in, in hybrids. Uh, so it's, it's, there's, there's plenty of work to go around. Yeah. Yeah. Just touching on promotion really quick here, and I won't try to over torture this segue, <laughs> But, you know, one of the ways that folks are promoting heavily now uh, in terms of books is, of course, social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and on and on. Um, and that social media also brings me back around to journalism and, you, and just in terms of information flow and what news is or isn't, et cetera. Um, are you a fan of social media? Do you wade into social media for promoting your own books? And also just sort of thinking about social media and its role in impact on our day-to-day -day lives. Well, yeah. I'll tell you, I wish uh, social media existed. I only, have, I only have the next 30 minutes. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I teach a whole class on yeah. this. But look, when I was a reporter, I wish we'd had social media. I would have been able to do a lot more research. You know, I didn't, we didn't have cell phones. I mean, it was still film, maybe videotape. Uh, but... You know, now you can go live like that with phone. Um, times have changed. The problem, of course, is that, you know, most people now when they post something, you know, they're reaching millions of people, but there's no editor on their shoulder going, where'd you get that? How do you know that's true? Yeah. So that's one of the frustrations I've got is that there's so much, there are so many lies out there that it's hard to, you know, to check you still need, I believe, as far as news is concerned, still need to get your information, from reputable sources, like the New York Times, Washington Post, Associated Press, you know, National Public Radio. I mean, there are, you know, tried and true, uh, 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 reputable journal sources that have editorial oversight. People don't understand the stuff that doesn't get on the air because they check it out. And so they don't just willy nilly throw things on the air. Um, as far as marketing is concerned, wow, that's it's it's wonderful because if you're shy or introverted, which a lot of are, um, social media can really be a godsend because it, you can do it the way it's tailored to your personality. You don't have to necessarily interface with other people, but you can reach 
other people in the way that's right for you. I mean, if you can master Twitter, you too can be president. <laughs> Same, you know? So, yeah, I mean, I think social media reaches so many people and that's what about as a, as a, as a book writer and marketer, you sell someone, you just tell them, you're having to persuade them. You just let them know you've written a book. So many ways to do that. Yeah. So where do we find you on social media? Uh, well, probably site johndedakis.com. I wish I had an easier name, uh, mm -hmm. but it's J-O-H-N, -E as in dog, E, D as in dog, A, K-I-S.com. On Facebook, I'm on Facebook more than I'm on Twitter. Twitter's, I'm not that kind of person. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Authors LinkedIn. A lot of different outlets. Yeah. It's hard to balance all the things you do in a day in terms of <laughs> writing your own copy, working with others, um, teaching, uh, and, and promoting what you've already put out there. I mean, every day is Saturday. I get to, I get uh -huh. to do what I want, and I all at once. So, you know, you, you, you pace yourself. But yeah, I mean, I, I probably shared from CNN 10 years before I did. Uh, I don't have to, you know, I'm not at the mercy of the news cycle. I get to do what I want. It's, a, it's about time. That's I great. highly recommend retirement. That's great. Well, fantastic. Uh, I think we could probably chat for hours, John. This has been a great overview. Um, speaking of your name, I during the middle of the chat here i i think i mispronounced your name and i'll get it out there correctly you wouldn't be the you wouldn't be the you wouldn't be the first you wouldn't well, be the first i apologize for that but as okay. we as we wrap up i always like to give our guests a chance to promote one other writer or maybe mention a book you recently read anything at all just to sort of pay pay it forward a little bit so now's your chance i have two one is a, a friend of mine uh bradley harper uh i met him at a writing uh, and and he took my classes and um, edited one of his manuscripts. An agent, the agent got him a two book deal. Uh, first book was nominated for an Edgar. The second won the Silver Falchion at uh, Killer Nashville, and it was the book of the year for them. Uh, he writes uh, those first two as uh, uh, as Sherlock Holmes, as Sir Sir Ken, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, and, and he's retired pathologist and uh, he saws at Bush Gardens. Really a tremendous guy, Bradley Harper. And, and the other, do, you have the wife, title, do you have the titles handy? On the first books? is uh, uh, the first one is A Knife in the Fog and the other is Queen's Gambit. And, uh, you know, both of them are really readable. The first one is basically uh, Sir Arthur Cornell, Arthur Cornell solves the Jack the Ripper uh, uh, killings. So it's historical fiction. And that's um, the one that was nominated for an Edgar, I believe. Is that that's correct? That's right. And I, uh, I think I met Bradley at uh, Mystery Writers of America meeting in New York when he was up for that Edgar. I'm pretty sure. There you, there you go. Yeah, really nice guy. Really nice. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely, yeah. you know, he's one to watch. And then another book, uh, my wife and I, I'm actually recommending the audio book. Uh, it's this. It's it's Rick Bachman, who wrote uh, A Man Covey, but the book that Cindy and I listened to uh, on audio is Anxious People. And the woman who narrates it, Mirren Ireland, is fabulous. There are probably about, I don't know, six or seven female characters in there, and each one is hilarious and well differentiated. There's some pathos in it. And I mean, it just brings the book alive as an audio book. Fantastic. Sounds, sounds, sounds terrific. Well, John Dedakis, thank you so much. So, so you say. Yeah. You say. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're going to be a lot of fun to talk with when you're out of Colorado gold. I can see uh, maybe, maybe you're, maybe you're a beer drinker or something. We can maybe grab a beer and it's entirely possible. Yeah. Yeah. What is the, <laughs> what is the local beer in, um, uh, Natty Bo is in Baltimore. Natty Bo, yeah, I'm, I'm from Wisconsin, so Heilemans Old Style oh, was yeah. the home brew back in the day. Yeah, well, I think you'd be a lot of fun around the bar and uh, elsewhere in the halls and all the over. So, 
look forward to running into you at Colorado Gold. And thank you so much in advance for coming out and doing this for us. And thank you so much for your time today. You're welcome. Thank you, Mark. It was fun. Thank you.